Julie Cruz is a magic operative down on her luck. She has a lot of power, but has been fucked over by clients, ex-lovers, and her own bad habits. Knowing she needs help, she goes looking for her guardian angel. But she gets something very different and very dangerous. A down-and-out magical practitioner like Constantine who makes way worse decisions decides one day that you know, she kind of needs a guardian angel to help her choose a lot of shit in her life and dealing with a terrible ex that she still has to work for. And because it's a book by Richard and I, everything goes to several literal hells. So kind of like Jessica Jones meets Hellraiser with my slightly worrying knowledge of human insights. I would like to kind of kick off the conversation, if it's okay with the both of you, by talking about how this collaboration came about because I um, was listening to Richard. I was listening to you on this is horror, I believe one time, and you were very Mm -hmm. um, positive about um, being able to collaborate with Cassandra and um, it sounded very exciting. And then when Cassandra, you joined me earlier this year, um, you had a lot of enthusiasm for, you know, being able to partner with, with Richard. So what was the, how did this, um, partnership come about? Oh, I think I was the one who broached the topic one day and do a co-writing thing with you first, but like there were no substantial ideas and you had that that takes the A tree and it's kind of like a skeleton yeah. at one point. Very much. And you asked about just it. like yes. a paragraph. <laughs> just Julie down on her luck magic person i think i had the guardian angel concept in there and that was kind of it and originally it was set in la and then i got yelled at and we set it in new york (laughs) also because we both love new york uh you you grew up here yeah until how old were you when you left new york oh i I was still a kid but you know so my i but still I'm, i'm part of the city and I've been living in New York on and off for like a decade now. It's six months at a time. Um, although I think I'm now here until I'm a very old person, in which case I promise Edinburgh my bones. So I'll be moving to Scotland, I think, in my 70s or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you guys were just basically having a conversation one day and we're like, hey, let's uh, let's work on something. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and you and that's cool. Um so that's interesting too, because uh, I was, I was, I, I think the natural inclination when you're talking to uh, people who had collaborated on a project is to like pick apart who did this and who did that. Um, but for me, I feel like from what I've read of Cassandra and and um, Richard, I, I, when I was reading the book, I was like, oh, this feels very Cassandra. This feels very like. So mm-hmm. um, between the two of you, was it a situation where? you were relying on each other's strengths to kind of like make up for stuff or was it just like kind of a fun, um, we work really well together and it doesn't matter who does what we're, we're both kind of really, um, the, just vibing with the story, I guess. I know that was was a really well worded question, but like, what was the dynamic like, I guess? Yeah. I absolutely relied on Richard or the actual novel part of it. Like the beginning was me that I've never done a novel before. I have no idea how to do a novel. Oh God, I can't do a novel. And Rich is just kind of dragging me along <laughs> going, it's fine. We just break this down into acts. Mm-hmm. So the idea of stretching out a book, giving it moments to breathe, building in character, rethinking how pacing works, because my novellas tend to be incredibly breakneck. Um, just letting that rest. Like I, I leaned on Richard for a lot of that, and I think I got to do most of the gooey stuff. <laughs> I don't. Um, I don't really at this point having gone over. I, I don't know who did what. Hello, calamity. <laughs> um. Really, in the process, I, I don't think you use the phrase relying on each other to make up for you know, what we needed. I don't think it was ever that. I think we both played to our strengths that we each had. 
And the way it all came together was neither of us has a big ego about this stuff. So everything we did was in service to the story. So if you ask who did what bit, who did the other bit, it doesn't exist anymore. There is no one of us who did the bit. We've been over it so much that we've, it's just a big, it's just a big succotash of, <laughs> of us and our words and our ideas. The only drawback of that was every time they, the editors came back with, hey, could you look at Paige Bruce? We both screamed a little bit and hid under furniture. Because at that point, I think we've each sort of gone over the book and edited it like it was our own thing, like two, three times. So it was essentially writing a book over and over again. Mm -hmm. Like we were essentially wrote two, 300,000 words each yeah. because we kept doing classes, moving out paragraphs, tweaking things to make it sound better to our own editorial ears. And that took a lot of focus. Mm -hmm. No, hmm. we, we could not deal with seeing the book towards the end, just like that. Oh, like, oh God. Ah. <laughs> yeah, I remember, so that, much. I remember that very last pass. It was just, it was agony. It was agony. We looked at it so much. And it's just that thing where you can't see it anymore. And they would ask yeah. a question, and all you could focus on was that one narrow area of the question, because the rest of the book was a blur. So is that different then from either of your experiences with um, going through editing the stuff you've written in the past? Um, or how is, is that different? It is for me because when it's just your own work, even if you don't remember all of it, you do carry a lot of it in your subconscious. Mm -hmm. And you sort of know what is happening when it's a co-written work, even when you've blended it together the way we've had like there is still, it's still half of someone else's heart and soul. And so, yeah, it's different. Your brain doesn't quite wash over it the same way. At least that's true for me. What about you? Same. Um, and also just when it's a, a putting together two different people's ideas into one thing and going over it so many times, they're just parts I don't remember. <laughs> at this point, which is like, well, which version of the book answers that question? So I literally want to go back and read the book again, just to get everything straight in my mind. Because we, we, we cut chapters, we added chapters, um, we changed the mythology. Change the locations. Change location. Oh, yeah, change locations. Okay. Um, you know, down to little, you know, uh, what coffee shop do they go to? What pizza parlor oh, do they God. go to? I mean. That, that was surprisingly complicated to figure out. Yes. <laughs> Trying to figure out the perfect <laughs> coffee shop that they would have visited. Yes. <laughs> so it's actually, um, that's actually not terribly uncommon for me to, when I'm talking to people about their books, to have them say something like, did this happen and ask me who had read it recently, right. did this happen in the book because they don't remember if that made it in or not. And so like, that is, that is definitely something that I've had in conversation often is, did this make it in? Um, so I got to imagine, yeah, it's, it's difficult to zoom out and know what the finished product is after, um, after it's changed so, mm -hmm. so much over time. <laughs> It's a defensive mechanism. I swear every writer has it at some point. Your brain just goes, no, I don't want to think about this book anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we're both on to other so, projects. So those other projects are filling up our brains. Yeah. Right, right. So, and that's the other thing. The timing of it is the book gets finished. Then it goes off to the publisher. You've moved on in your creative yes. sphere to something else. Mm -hmm. And now that it comes time for it to release and promote it, you have to like kind of reset your brain on how do I talk about this thing? So um, that's got to be, that's got to be a challenge too, especially since you're about to tour. So yeah, I have two novels to finish by the end of the year too. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm trying to finish a book before we go on tour. So that's a week. So, oh, well, and here you are. Uh, well, I'm even more grateful for your time then. Yeah. Nice break. <laughs> um, 
So I want to acknowledge right off the bat that this book is really fucking fun. It is a real fun story. And um, like all things aside, the cover draws you in. It's it's an amazing cover. But like from the very beginning of the book, even the first chapter, it's just really fun and it sucks you into this world. So um, I just want to commend you for making an incredibly entertaining story, first of all. Thank you. It's, it's got a lot of weirdness to it, but like in a fun, cool way. And when I'm kind of thinking about how I would explain it to people, mm. uh, a reference comes to mind. And I want to know if this means anything to either of you. Have you guys heard of Has Been Hotel? Yes. <gasps> that is a good reference. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, my um, girlfriend's older kid had introduced me to Has Been Hotel and Hell of a Boss. And... I'm reading through this book and I'm, you know, I'm really enjoying it, but it's like got this weird stuff and it's got gross stuff and offensive stuff sometimes and stuff, but it's so fucking fun. And I'm like, what, what does this remind me of? And that's like kind of the reference that came to mind. So hopefully that's like kind of a compliment or, or a good thing for, for you. For me. I love Hotel. Okay, cool. Right on. Um, yeah, I don't know if there was a question there, but like, <laughs> um, the, the, the general tone while it, it, oh, if you guys see a random, like, did you see that thumbs up? Just came I up on my screen. Yeah, little ghost. Yeah. It's the new Mac software. Like it recognizes hand gestures and, and turns them <sighs> into like, little, like Zen Foster. Uh, no. can't see this at home, but I'm absolutely make, making thumbs up at the, <laughs> the camera right now. Um, yeah. So, uh, it's just, was it, I guess, was the goal to make a lighthearted entertainment, entertaining kind of tale? Or what was like the overall focus of, of this? We wanted it to be fun, it seems like. Did we have an overall goal? <laughs> Besides well, to write a good book? Um, I think it's pretty fun, but I also think that there's a fairly, fairly heavy level of darkness in that book too, both on a supernatural and a very personal level. There is some genuinely bad people in that book, which is balanced, I think, with some people who are not terrible and actually kind of fun, interesting and supportive characters. So I think overall the book's fun, but it, it does, we worked hard to balance out the horror and the humanity of the book. I agree. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's definitely, I, I, I think that when I, especially with the books I've been reading lately, I've gone so deep into like the really serious themes that I feel like for this one, because it had like a very fun, entertaining side to it. I wanted to like, make sure that people know it's there. Cause I've, I've been diving into like really, really deep stuff, but that was kind of going to be another thing that I, I, I mentioned is that there's some really touching interactions between the characters so obviously julie cruz who is the the protagonist um has some not so great interactions with um her ex you know tyler but then her kind of longtime best friend sarah shows up and the relationship between her and sarah is um like incredibly touching uh and what i thought was great about that was so sarah had had uh, a run in with her husband and was kind of going to Julie to get away from that situation. So there's, um, we're different people in different parts of our lives, but we rely on each other. And, um, it, it almost feels like it was a situation where they didn't realize how much they needed each other in that moment until they were with each other. So that's kind of the feeling I got from Julie and Sarah was, you know, I know I'm safe with this person, but I maybe I didn't realize how much I actually needed them or something. Um, I think it's a lot of us channeling just how the world is right now. There is so much of a push, so much societal programming that says you need to be self-sufficient no matter what. There's only space for one person at the top. If you succeed, no one else can. And like, Recently, especially recently, I think uh, there's been a counter response in that people are going like, no, humanity is made out of community. We cannot survive without each other. 
But I think especially in America, where you have to be the greatest, it's very easy to forget that there are people you want to rely on. And I think in this era of like social media, and like everything else that's going on, it becomes even scarier to rely on other people because you never know who is out there to use your vulnerabilities and your weaknesses for clout. And I think a lot of that came true with these two characters and the way they interacted, especially Julie, who knows she's a fuck up. She has no illusion about that. <laughs> yes. She's in a very bad place and it's all literally her own fault. Yes. Mm -hmm. Julie loves Sarah and cocaine. <laughs> and vodka. And vodka. Don't forget. Not necessarily in that order. Um. And then another thing about Sarah that I thought was nice throughout this book was um, ostensibly she had kind of a perfect life mm -hmm. or what would seem to be a perfect life pre coming to visit Julie. And obviously that wasn't true. There was real trouble in her life, but the way that she kind of grew into her own and having a place in Julie's story was a really cool kind of evolution as well. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much. That was... I think so. You first. Uh, I was intentional. We hoped that putting the two of them together, people would feel that growing relationship, even when they weren't necessarily aware of how much they were coming to depend on each other or in denial about it at times. Um, yeah. I think I also channeled a lot of my own upbringing, trying to, while trying to write Sarah. Um, I, I My family wasn't quite as picture perfect as Sarah's. Well, certainly wasn't a Midwestern kind of family, but like as the eldest kid of a very traditional Asian family, you are taught endlessly to be the best, get the best grades, all those little stereotypes are unfortunately true, at least with my family. And when you do all of that, it also becomes really easy to not want to talk about the bad things. Uh, my family was incredibly abusive. Uh, in all of the possible ways. And as I grew up, my mother would tell me over and over again, you can't tell anyone about this. And I would ask why, and she would like, because it's shameful for me, for our family, for you. It is an embarrassment that you endured all of this. If people knew, they would look down on you. Uh, which as a grown up, I'm like, I have no clue why she would say that. That makes no logical sense. But I remember being in my early 20s and feeling that way. And I think some, a lot of that ended up in Sarah before she slowly learned to, you know, come into her own. Yeah, we, yeah. we both come from abusive backgrounds. And I think I had that, had that same experience of you can't talk about this. And so it was easy to channel that in both our experiences. Mm -hmm into the book because yeah. um, I've only started talking about this stuff publicly fairly recently. Um, actually really even after the book in some, some cases. So I think the book kind of kicks some, kicks some stuff loose for me. Um, well, then you've also got Julie, the main character who um, I, I understand that like some of, what's going on in her life is, is she's kind of uh, reckless and, and isn't helping herself out all the time, but she's definitely got forces that are working against her too. So she's kind of getting kind of crushed down by the world a little bit herself, um, maybe mm -hmm. in a different way, but she's got her own adversity to kind of overcome mm -hmm. uh, as well. Was that different or are we kind of pulling from similar kind of, experiences for for that aspect of julie too oh god definitely from similar instances. the two of us have had very interesting lives They're very interesting good ones yeah um, 
Well, uh, like, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> some of it came from, we, we, we've both had some very, yes, odd lives, odd jobs, but also we've, we've dealt with the corporate world in ways and absorbed a certain amount of the regular world, the straight world is, is as evil as any crime syndicate you would ever want to think about. And so that combined with the other elements, um, I think really gave the book another level uh, to play with. Which makes me think about then um, also, I'm looking at my, my notes to the side here, but um, cause I'll forget every name possible, but Tyler works for a law firm called <laughs> Thorne and Dirk. And, yes. um, and that's kind of like what you are just talking about, put to like the extreme kind of version of that, where it's all about power and stepping on each other to succeed and, and like do anything for my own, you know, my own success and stuff like that. So, um, that, that feels like that's kind of an extreme version of, of corporate greed and stuff like that represented in the book. Is it an extreme version though? People in a corporate world can be genuinely terrible. I don't know if it's extreme. I think it might actually just be on the proper level, but that's just me. No, I, <laughs> I, I agree completely. Um, we really kind of take Wall Street to task in this book. And I would not be surprised at all if the stuff we wrote about is 100% true. This this book <laughs> could all, all be nonfiction material if we dug deep enough into the uh, Fortune 500. Oh, yeah. it's definitely happening in the games industry, at least. Oh, my God. The stories that came out of Ubisoft of all the things that people have done. Yeah. Oh. Like, there, uh, the games industry had a Me Too movement some time ago, and it came out, among other things, that it was like this one game director who thought it was perfectly normal to grab someone by the throat and slam them into a wall in the middle of a public party. Oh my god. Um, yeah, a lot of my feelings about the games industry and what's happening in the darkness there is definitely in Tyler's farm. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Um, yeah. And I guess I, I should probably qualify for people who haven't read the book yet. Uh, I guess what I meant when I said extreme versions was like bringing in elements of cosmic horror um, and, and like, you know, that kind of more, uh, you know, that, I guess that's what I mean. Not necessarily the actions of the people, but the actual presence of like, um, cosmic horror and beings like that I, I i would say is but yeah like oh, oh i wasn't re- I, I wasn't being sarcastic <laughs> earlier i think if there's any chance of cosmic <laughs> horrors getting you power and money on wall street those people are sacrificing down in the basement as we speak and Fair happily and happily well and that that's the thing about it reading reading the book and reading what they do yeah it does seem like yeah this totally makes sense i could absolutely see people doing that for sure oh, yeah um, All I have to do is kill the janitor and I get a Bugatti. That seems cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, so interesting, though. I, I I I hadn't really considered the fact that maybe this was drawing on personal experience too, like the whole mega evil corporation side of things. Um, I guess it's kind of unfortunate that that has to be a possibility. But yeah, it hadn't occurred to me. So that's that's super interesting. Um, I have to imagine the publishing industry has shadows and bad stuff as well. All industries. Every yeah. industry, especially creative industries, I think are industries that involve a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. And also we, um, we can, we can, we can think about creative industries more because we go in a little innocent expecting creative people and industries to be more enlightened. And then you get there and realize, oh, no, everyone's a jackass everywhere you go. Okay, got it. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. 
it's it, it, it is a, it, an entertaining part of the book where you get to see kind of your take on what that looks like. And um, the thing I think that I took away most from that is the like the the way that yes, doing the killing the janitor gets you the Bugatti, but then at some point everyone's the janitor in in one way or another where like their downfall can lead to someone else succeeding. So it's like, you're almost dooming yourself by participating in that type of a thing. That's the corporate world. There's always, there's <laughs> always that one more carnivore con of, you know, a uh, predator above you. You think you think you're the apex predator, but there's always one more. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes it's just time as well. I don't think there's any way to get around. It. If you get involved in this kind of power games, eventually you get old and the young hungry creatures that come after you are very eager to sacrifice you next. Yeah. Like the only way to win is not to be part of the game, I think. Mhm. Mm yeah, figure out your own weird way around things. And being nice. <laughs> being nice is very very <laughs> underrated. Being kind is more necessary in this world, god. Yeah. Well, and I think Sarah really represents that a lot in the book is like, um, at least for me, like my impression as a reader coming out of it is just like, um, Sarah will do anything kind of for her friend. And obviously like Julie's the same way and, and, and that's, that comes out too. But like Sarah for me really represents like, um, kind of an unconditional love kind of thing. Mm-hmm. She, she's a very sunshine cinnamon roll. Yes. <laughs> Our darling princess who can do no wrong. Except, um, you know, terrible things to the world she, accidentally. She's also, she's that person who represents kindness in a way in the world right now that is, it's not rare, but it's not necessarily appreciated. Yeah. I don't know how long it's been, but it feels like a long time now that kindness has been seen as weakness. And that's a very yeah. creepy and dangerous uh, thing, I think. And Sarah really, with all she's been through, hasn't lost her ability to be kind. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And, and so that kind of makes me zoom out on, on the Julie situation in general. So um, for people who obviously haven't read the book yet, um, there's Julie, who's the protagonist. Um, she it, it is, as was kind of summarized at the very beginning of the episode, she's going through some hard times and she's looking for her guardian angel. But like what she gets isn't exactly that. But she's got kind of a Scooby gang of, of friends that are kind of helping her out um, in um, Dead Air which is a, a friend who does like kind of technology magic stuff is, is how I shorthand it in my brain. Um, St. Joan is like the, this magical landlady kind of situation. She, she owns and runs, <laughs> runs the building that <laughs> we all, whenever we're taking in a story, we kind of shorthand things to ourselves. So you're just getting mm -hmm. my, like, this is the way my brain catalogs things. <laughs> um, so she's got Joan, she's got dead air. She's got Sarah. And then, you know, there's, other kind of smaller characters throughout, but like they like the two. So Joan and, and dead air are in the world that Julie's in and they kind of get how things work and they understand the gravity of some of the things that are happening. And so they naturally underestimate Sarah's potential contribution to the story and mm -hmm. her kind of shining through and showing, Hey, I'm kind of more useful than you thought I, I was. <laughs> was was really cool too like they get it they know what's going on but they also kind of um don't try as hard because of that like they feel like they know that you know things are going to go a certain way and sarah keeps pushing so she's that kind of necessary momentum almost for the story too i think it sort of ties to that story of uh, parable i don't know the exact phrase of it that I heard some time ago where talent only takes you so far. Stubbornness just kind of carries you the rest of the way. And I think what you're <laughs> saying is very much emblematic of that idea with that Aaron St. Joan loved him. Sort of 
falling into the belief that their talent and their knowledge is sufficient and Sarah having none of it just kind of perseveres, Mm -hmm. which I think is a lesson everyone in the publishing industry eventually picks up as well. Like to not be jealous, to not think too hard about everyone else's opportunities and what they've done and just barrel along at your own pace. Because if you work at it long enough and hard enough, uh, things do happen. But also one word also in Sarah's favor is for all they underestimate her by the end of the book, she does some of the most badass stuff of any of them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. She does. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So it is an interesting dynamic. Um, one, and I, and I kind of want to dig into a little bit of the magic and the mythology, if that's okay. Um, sure. Because there's some really cool uh, ways that magical stuff happens. And one that I feel is very um, really, like stuck with me was how like the barbed wire thing that Julie's got going on where it's like, yeah. and, and I'm going to describe it terribly. Um, but like, basically she's got kind of, can can one of you maybe exp- explain what I'm talking about? Because it was such a vivid, cool image, um, the way that she's got this barbed wire magic thing going on. She has barbed wire just lashed around her arms and just, they live there. They're almost grown in there through magical means. And the constant background pain of it in many ways is what, allows her magic to happen and in the mythology of this world at least that people have learned if you're willing to endure pain the exchange is power you get power through all of it and the barbed wire and her constantly living with that sensation 24 hours seven days a week is yeah that's what makes julie julie and not many people can pull that off not many people can have that power because can you imagine just every single day, no matter how you move, you can just feel the little thorns and barbs slowly digging into your flesh in every configuration, in every moment. And it goes into some of her self-medication too. I mean, she has a lot of fun with it. She makes light of it, but she is in pain as Cass said, all the time. Yeah. And that just kind of presents an interesting, um, dynamic to the magical element of the story is that like magic has a consequence or a cost I think is very good but then also you know it's finite like if there's only so much of that barbed wire that exists to draw Mm -hmm. from before like it's gone and then if it's not there you got to make do without it so there was a cool kind of um, limitation or and slash also cost to having that type of mm-hmm. magic available to you. Oh, I really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, you have to have limitations in magic. I mean, I'm always aware in fantasy and horror of people gaining too much power and becoming godlike. And then when a character has too much power all the time, it's just like, well, what's the point? Yeah. Right. Then it's like, what's, what's, why do I even care about this story? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, another element that I would be remiss with not mentioning would be the goriness of it. Um, <laughs> there is absolutely goriness uh, to, to the story big time. And were those cooperatives things or did someone write more of that than, than the other? Or did we, did we both have fun getting really gory with the story? I, I had most of the gore. Yeah. But <laughs> because of the mouse and trust in my extreme love of running around the chapters, carrying buckets of entrail and just slopping it on everything. Although what happened to Brad was entirely you. And that was very fun. I just added little details after that. Mm-hmm. I like making things squishy, though, <laughs> universally. That's just my thing. Yeah, Cass is really good at that. I tried to keep up. I would just try to springboard when they would uh, <laughs> really pour on the gore, and sometimes I would jump in and like, I want to play too. And I would, put, <laughs> I would put in my bits. Quite literally. They're, quite literally. Yeah. 
<laughs> One of the more vivid ones that stuck with me was um, how... So when we think about demon possession, for example, in, in the stories we've you know, kind of experienced throughout our lives, it's much, it's kind of like a nebulous thing. And something like that kind of happens in this story, but in a way where like, I'm kind of putting you on as like a person suit. And (laughs) that specifically was really kind of fucked up to imagine so that one really stuck with me i'm so happy i know exactly which part you're set talking about mm-hmm. that one was very fun to write for us <laughs> but really like any of the scenes where so um as we kind of referred to a little bit the uh looking for the guardian angel part going wrong what does show up is is one of the main causes of gore and um and the descriptions of the the kind of aftermath of what that character does um, is it a, a crazy old? I'm not going to say it wrong, um, but um, yeah, that character does not well, you know, doesn't doesn't let anything go to waste. I guess like uh, on its victims, like everything seems to have a purpose at least. <laughs> Listen. The the natural world is incredibly efficient. Like look at whale fall when a single whale dies, like entire ecosystems spring out of it. It only makes sense that even supernatural things don't put things to waste. Humanity is the only one that's like, ew. I want to eat the entrails. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I say this to somebody who won't eat entrails. Like I I can't do tripod love or heart whatsoever. So I know I'm being a hypocrite, but yes. Makes no sense. (laughs) Um well, yeah, I guess, um, but I, I wouldn't say that the gore is done in a way where it would it would be something that I think would like people wouldn't would put it down or anything. I don't think it's like a put down moment. Like if if you got if you get, I don't think people would get too pushed too far. Um, so I think that's important to talk about too. Oh, um, I think it's. Yeah. Oh, I'm just jumping in there. I think it's because we try not to keep to make it gratuitous. The point is never pleasure in the pain. Like none of the character, you don't see us spending pages upon pages lingering on how they suffer and how scared they are. There are, of course, pages and pages of gore, but <laughs> it is almost at a remove, I think. And I think that's what makes the difference. Like that's why some horror feels incredibly icky. Some horror is about taking joy that another human being or another creature is in enormous amounts of pain and watching very, very intently as they suffer forever. And yeah, we, we try to keep away from that in this book as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's more the impact of, um, yes. it's the impact of what it, of what happens as opposed to like the thing itself. Yeah. Yes. Um, it's not for lawyers, really. It is no, yeah. I guess to kind of not summarize, but to kind of draw back to the bigger picture, to zoom out a little bit. Uh, this was conceived as a duology, and so this is part one of two. Mm-hmm. And um, I feel like the setup, uh, the setup for book two is is really interesting because um, it just promises more super big challenges but um was that uh was that tricky to do to plan how to pace out or map out this story knowing that it was like kind of half of a bigger story um i don't think so we are we always knew this was going to be a longer thing so a lot of it was i think discussed pretty early on while we were doing the outline process Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are holes in the story and the mythology that we can fill in as we go on. Um, that would be more that would be more fun for people than to sort of stop in the middle of book one and go, "Well, yeah. this is this is what this represents. These are these gods." So there was uh, there was stuff we knew we we could we were setting up to use in book two. Plus, we wanted book one to feel like a complete book like you don't Mm -hmm. 
we don't want anyone to feel cheated. There are a lot of these books that come out now and end on some massive cliffhanger. And we didn't want to cheat people like that. If you, you know, um, this had to feel like a complete product. Yeah. I'm also randomly very excited for book two because of one of the large squishy secrets of the universe gets revealed there. Yes. I'm like holding it like close to my heart and I'm so keen to see how people respond to it. Um, the cosmology is very messed up. <laughs> even more you can guess. <laughs> well, yeah, I think my comment about uh, what you said, Richard, is that it feels like the first book was, and I, and I love kind of when it ends up this way. Um, the first book has its own like really good arc where, you know, um, it tells a complete story, but it finishes the story revealing potential for so much more. Um, and so I, and I think I, I posted on social media about it when I finished it about like the, the my immediate thought when I finished the book was just like, I can't wait to continue reading this story. So, um, it absolutely is a story unto itself, but it, it tells you, Hey, there's more. It like makes a promise that like, we got more story for you. So that was really good. Oh yeah. Thank you. Thank you. On that note, are you, are you, um, are you guys in the process of, of writing the next book or I, I understand you guys have other projects that you're, you're already working on. So what's the <laughs> status of book two? It's, a, it's still in, we're working out the details. You know, that's all you're getting. And I say, I didn't get to show up and, and I... yeah, that, that's, that's kind of it. There's a lot of cosmology. There's a lot of other stuff going on. Uh, that's kind of it. Cool. Sorry. No, I, I, that's a perfectly acceptable answer. I, I, I think that anybody who loves reading stories loves anticipation as much as I do love reading the story. So I, I think that, that kind of a teaser is just as satisfying as if you gave me the whole story. Um, I'm glad. Now I, I, I want to talk about other stuff you guys have going on because um, I had heard about uh, the dead take the a train along, you know, earlier at the, toward the beginning of the year. And I was excited to like, cause I had talked to you, Cassandra and it was a great conversation. And I was like, we need to keep going. So I knew I wanted to do this conversation a long time ago. But then the Pale House Devil pops up, and I was like, oh, man, like, these guys are just cranking out such great stuff. So uh, that that's coming out, uh, I think, October 3rd, right? No, that's – it's it, uh, uh, the Dead Take the A Train is October 3rd. The Pale House Devil is October 10th. Oh, uh, God. So we will literally okay. be on yeah. tour when I have, my second book comes out. <laughs> we'll let you know if he freaks out that way. Yes. Yeah, that seems like a heavy, uh, heavy schedule of things for you. But yeah. what's the general kind of idea of Pale House Devil? If you if you have a quick Pale House Devil is a story of two hitmen, Ford and Neuland. Uh, Ford is alive. Neuland is dead. Ford kills the dead. Neuland kills the living. They are professionals. They start out in New York. A job goes bad. They head out west to sort of let things cool off a bit and they finally take a job with an eccentric millionaire and what they find in this job it seems very simple when they walk in the door they find something that is not alive or dead and they have to figure out what to do with it yeah it sounds fantastic and excellent cover too the cover art is I'm incredible really happy with it titan did a great job yeah that is a gorgeous cover yeah, I just it's one of those where it's like it'll be it'll be sitting up on a shelf like this because it's just really nice to look at. All right. Um so that's October 10th. 10th. So Dead Take the A Train October 3rd. Yes. Um that's the 10th. Uh and then Cassandra, what what's on the horizon outside of Dead Take the A Train? I know I, as someone who interviews people, I always feel bad. You're here to talk about this thing. And I'm like, what's coming next? And it's kind of like unfair, but. Oh, I, I can't talk about any of them yet. But a tie in novel next year with a, a big IP that I think a lot of people will be familiar with if they watch streaming stuff a lot, like Twitch streams a lot. And after that, uh, we'll. we'll 
you should be able to reveal stuff about the Dark Academia novel that I am doing that is going to be large and terrible and frightening. It is, I guess, the Magicians meets Squid Game, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good way to put it. <laughs> wow, With that's awesome. a lot of squishy bits. So many squishy bits. There is a giant spider woman eating someone in this chapter right now that I'm polishing. I gotta, I gotta say, it's, it's gr- like when you say squishy, it sounds so innocent. But oh, you know what I mean when I say squishy. It's definitely not. It's almost like how, um, if you guys know Max Booth the uh, Third, sure, he always says he's like the guy who says spooky about stuff, mm-hmm. and he's sometimes talking about stuff that's really, really dark. But I just think it's like his kind of signature word is is spooky. So that's what <laughs> when you say squishy, it makes me think like that's that's your thing. I, I kind of stole it from uh, Ursula Vernon. She blurbed nothing but black and teeth and sent like four different versions of a possible blurb. Um, they used a different one, but the one I loved was just delicate and squishy. And no one had described my work as squishy before, and I just latched onto it. And I'm hoping if I keep saying the word squishy, it'll eventually be the word people associate with my writing. <laughs> well, it worked on me, so Yay. that's one down. <laughs> is, is it, you should get that T-shirt for uh, for the tour, delicate and squishy. Oh, yeah. oh, that's going to get someone to try a fight with me, and then that's going to end well, very that's, poorly. I, I, I want to see you kick. I want to see you kick someone's ass, basically. Giselle could be very mad if I get in, into a fight at a bar. <laughs> Giselle is one of our publicists. Yes. Um, so speaking of your tour, because I'm going to try and turn this episode around and get it out as soon as possible. Um, what does the tour look like? Uh, so I know that, and I have to thank you both so much for doing a Midwest event (laughs) because so many people are East coast, West coast and not really venturing to the center of the country much. So a, thank you. B what, what's the tour look like? You you want to run down of of the stop? Sure. Kentucky, um, Pittsburgh, Rhine, uh, upstate New York. Yeah. And I'm personally heading out to New Haven, Connecticut for an event, but it hasn't been confirmed yet, so I can't tell you where. <laughs> and, and there's New York Comic Con. Oh, God, New York Comic Con, yes. Very cool. Very cool. Thank you. First of all, thank you for taking the time to join me. Um, it was it was something that I wanted to do since like I heard about this book, and then I read oh, the book, and it was like... Such a good book that I was like, yeah, I need to talk to these folks. So hopefully, hopefully you had a little bit of a good time. But I really appreciate you guys taking the time to join me today. I hope you'll be able to meet us at the tour stop in Chicago. Yeah, 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 definitely. I'll be the guy who looks like this, (laughs) but but wearing a mask. So uh, with those events, are you doing readings or is it Q&A or signings or what's the is it different based on the stop you're on? There'll definitely be signings, but I don't know about the readings. I think okay. it's going to depend on what you want from us. Oh, God, gotcha. I hadn't even thought about readings. I'm hoping it's just like Q&A and, and, and <laughs> folks, because, oh, God, I just, that, <laughs> unprepared for unprepared for readings. No, well, I didn't mean to put more anxiety in your life, but oh, you yeah, I'm going to get you guys <laughs> you to did. sign all this note. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, on that note, oh, the connection's bad. <laughs> Um, I want to wrap up by saying to anybody who's listening or watching that Dead Take the A-Train is absolutely an incredibly entertaining, intricate intricate um, book that is one of my favorite stories to read. And it reads quick and it's just really great. And um, it's obvious that the two of you have a really good chemistry for writing together. So I definitely recommend people check it out. I will have links on my stuff um, for, for pre-orders and, and everything like that. Um, and it's, yeah, it's just, I think it was a great book. And, and thank you for putting it out in the world. Thank you very thank much. Thank you for having me. 